Thank you everybody for uh, tuning in to our yet another um, educational webinar. Um, hope that you'll really find uh, this, this session very useful. Um, so um, I'm going to start by introducing uh, different members of our team that we have here. So I'll start with our business development team. So I have here Elon, my colleague, just maybe say a few, few words and hello. Morning, everyone. Nice to see a lot of familiar faces, and uh, we hope to have a fun-filled, packed hour. All right. Thank you, Alon. Uh, I'm Brianna. Uh, go ahead. Hi, everyone. My name is Brianna Frith, and I'm part of the Business Development Department at Access Law. I'm super happy to see you guys join us, and I can't wait to have a fun-filled hour. Thank you, Brianna. And then I'm going to introduce you our CEO and co-founder, Lena Koch. How are you, Lena? Hi, Cheyenne. Thanks for the intro. Excited to be here today. I know you have some, uh, some good topics lined up that I think will be uh, enlightening for all of us. Thank you. Yes, we do, certainly. Uh, and we have our um, head real estate lawyer, Shangami. How are you, Shangami? Oh, maybe you're muted, Shangami. Hi everyone. Um, I'm sure I've spoken to many of you um, throughout, you know, our transactions um, with our office. But it's nice to meet everyone virtually. Awesome. Thank you, Shangami. And we have Jazz here, so he's also one of our real estate lawyers. So he's going to be talking to us quite a bit today as well. So thank you, Jazz. Uh, Morning, everyone. Yeah, so my name is Jazz. Uh, I assist uh, Shanks with the day-to-day -day operation of our real estate department, uh, mainly in the agreement review portion. So any kind of assignments you need reviewed, new build agreements, star certificates, uh, I'm usually the one handling those. Awesome. Thank you, Jazz. So I just thought uh, we start a little bit with um, with just like how our, our firm has been um, in, in been adapting to the current uh, COVID-19 conditions where everybody's essentially working from home um, and you know, running Zoom, Zoom webinars, Zoom meetings. So I thought I'd just use this opportunity to ask Lena, what are some things that we've been doing really lately to be able to service clients all over at the comfort of their own home for their wills, for their real estate transactions? Maybe if you can speak a little bit about that, that'd be great. No problem, Cheyenne. Um, so since um, over the past several months, I guess since March, we've really increased the number of clients who are interested in taking advantage of the fact that we offer virtual signups. We have probably close to 90% of our clients who now opt to do everything virtually. And what's nice about that is we can do a lot of these things before um, the pandemic hit but they're really being embraced right now, especially part, partly due to new laws, but also partially due to the fact that people have a, an increased level of comfort with it. So what's great about that is because we're able to do a lot of these things virtually, we can close transactions a lot more quickly. We're a lot more flexible. We're able to, um, you know, we were always a firm that's open seven days a week, including evenings to be able to conduct signups or client meetings. But now it's a lot easier because if we're, you know, doing a sign up at 730 at night, we're doing it, you know, clients are doing it in the comfort of their own home. They're having dinner and then they can do a quick sign up and put their kids down to bed or whatever they want to do. It's just that it, it affords so much more flexibility, especially in times when people don't necessarily want to have to go out of the house and put on a mask and trudge into an office. Um, so it has, I, I feel like it's really ushered in a new chapter of convenience for people, as well as just just streamlined our ability to, to service our customers. And the, the feedback we've been getting has been absolutely positive. People are thrilled. So um, just to kind of give a quick overview, we do signups across Ontario virtually right now. So that's from your house, from your couch, from your chair, from wherever you want to sit, your front porch. Um, you can do a full sign up with you know, one of our lawyers or signing agents, however we decide to set that up. We also, in the rare case that someone does want physical um, documents signed, we have a full mobile signing network as well, which reaches all corners of the province. And then, of course, we have our, our seven physical offices across the province, where if you do want to come in, meet with us face to face, we're here. We're happy to meet with you as well. All right. 
Thank you for that. Um, so we're just going to uh, dive into our questions. Before I start that, what I want to mention is if you have any questions that you'd like us to address after we're done with our presentation, if you could just kindly write, there's a chat box on the, on the bottom center of your screen. So if you don't mind, you can write up your questions and we'll be sure to get to it, uh, as many of it as we can at the end of our presentation. So, um, so without further ado, I'll just start with our presentation. So, so Shangami, if you don't mind maybe just talking a little bit about what does a title insurance cover to protect buyers in a real estate transaction? Uh, yeah, definitely. So um, title insurance uh, provides protection from losses that are a result of unknown title defects, um, existing liens against the property, um, encroachment issues, title fraud, things like that. Um, so title insurance is, is a fine, it protects the client or the buyer from any financial loss that is re as a result of one of those issues listed or mentioned. Um, now, uh, sometimes clients are, they hear the word insurance and they think it's like a, a monthly fee or it's a recurring fee, which is not the case. It is a one-time fee that we advise the client as well. Um, so it's a one-time fee that, um, that is paid on closing of the transaction. Um, so the title insurance will protect um, the buyer from any financial loss um, and will cover the losses up to the maximum coverage that's set out in the policy. Um, now, generally, there's two policies. There's an owner policy and there's a lender policy. The owner policy protects the property owner from any title related losses and the lender policy protects the lender if, for example, the mortgage is considered um, invalid. Um, so something that like uh, an issue that may happen is title fraud. So for example, someone steals your identity, um, they forge documents, they forge, um, you know, your signature and they register a lien against the property and take the equity out of uh, your home and run away with the money or disappear. Um, title insurance will uh, cover any financial loss resulting of that fraud. Um, what title insurance does not cover um, are damages such as, you know, flooding or fire damages to the property, general wear and tear, um, theft, uh, which is something that um, we usually explain to the client because, again, when they hear the word insurance, they assume or associate the, the things that would not be covered under title insurance. Um, so that's something we do advise the buyer of as well. Um, so those are general, that's like the general gist of what title insurance is. It's protections awarded to the buyer um, and what's not also not covered in title insurance. Just one little thing. So from what you're saying is if there are ever a case from a client standpoint, if there are, their identities are being stolen, will, will they be the ones to actually be submit a claim or would they actually have to go through um, a law office, for example, us in this Yeah, case. so, yeah, so the client can definitely submit a claim on their own, um, but it is also best that if they have a lawyer that dealt with the transaction, just reach out to the lawyer as well, um, and we normally, if there are any issues, we've never had a situation like that uh, before, but um, if there's, like, you know, tax arrears that the seller um, did not pay, and um, the, the and the the seller is has gone MIA and is refusing to make that payment. Um, we would make a title insurance claim. So the client just comes back to us, um, and we make the title insurance claim on their behalf, and then let the, and then title insurance will handle it at that point. Okay, great. Thank you. Uh, so Shayami, is it wise for clients to buy and sell a property on the same year? I think that's a really um, <laughs> It's a, um, it's a really question that we get asked a lot. And I think it's, it's a conversation a lot of real estate professionals also talk to their clients about. Yeah. So I think it would be good to kind of give our perspective. So when actually like mortgage agents or mortgage professionals or partners talk to their clients, they also have a legal take on this subject as well. So I thought if you could maybe just talk about some of the pros and cons of, of, of it. So... Our off, whenever I see that any of our clients are buying uh, or selling to buy, 
my heart races a little bit only because I, I want to make sure that everything goes smoothly. Um, you know, obviously we can't control when the seller is, when our client is selling and there's a purchaser buying their sold property or property that they're selling. Um, we can't control what the, that buyer is going to do. We don't control their mortgage, whether they get funds. We, we can't control that part of it. So I'm secretly a, a control freak and I like to control everything. <laughs> so the part, the fact that I can't control that aspect of the transaction um, and it's, you know, a lot of the time our clients need those funds in order to like fund their purchase right so that's a little that that scares me a little and that's the only issue with um selling to buy it's great because you know when it's on the same day the client doesn't need to get bridge financing um if they're selling the property after um they're purchasing their property they don't need to get bridge financing things like that um but the issue that we have with sales sale uh, a sale to buy is like i said we can't control what goes on with the new the purchaser of our clients um, sold property. So if, for example, you know, it's a late funding. So say the buyer of uh, the buyer is now funded super late, they get funds into our trust account, they have until 6pm technically to get funds into our trust account. But if they uh, get it in at 6pm, we've are obviously missed the cutoff for the sale um, for our property that we're I mean, for the for our clients that are now purchasing their property, we've missed the cutoff to use those funds to fund the, their new purchase. Um, so we would have to ask for an extension at that point. Um, and we can't ask for those funds from the purchaser because they have until 6 p.m. to get the funds into our trust account, if that makes sense. Um, so it gets a little tricky in that sense. Um, but if, for example, the purchaser is uh, unable to close on that day and requires an extension and then we need to go and get an extension for our new purchase we would whatever the extension terms are we would just transfer that to the purchaser um, who was unable to close on our sale to make sure they cover the cost of any extension terms that are associated with our new purchase does that make some sense yeah, I think it certainly does I think one of the also good practices is if obviously um, because they're mortgage mortgage brokers are involved, I think if there is an opportunity for them to be able to have their um, purchase transaction or sales transaction a day or two arranged for, for bridge finance, I think it would just give them that a little bit of a breathing room. Um, because I think if we're getting stressed, I can't even imagine what our clients also go through as yeah. well, because they're also moving, they're looking for keys. So I think it would be a great practice that uh, they have their closing day probably a day or two, yeah. Um, you know, after their purchase, just just so that there's there's no issues with their moving and they're not really being stressed out. They have a million other things to worry about, right? Yeah, and then another thing to consider is if you're selling to buy as well, um, you have to be out of your sold the property you're selling. You have to be out by a certain time, so you can't be you can't sell your property. It closed, and then you're still moving out because now it's technically the new purchaser's home. So um, there's a little a little bit of stress with that um, because they're trying to like gather all their things up and move, but now the property has sold and it's it's now in the purchaser's name and they have to get out. We've had issues like that where our clients like, we need time, we, we still need to move out. And it's been a little bit of an issue um, with that. So that's also something to consider, bring it up with your clients when discussing selling to buy as well, that they it's best practice that they're out of their, their sold property by latest 12 p.m. Got it, okay. But if they, if, um, so check out, so if there is, um, if they are, they have to sell, buy and sell on the same day. Is there anything that they can do in terms of their sale of their property to have it close earlier that you know of? Just, just you know, let we we when we're selling to buy, we let the the buyer's lawyer know in advance that our client is selling to buy. So like, just give us some sort of update on on what the process is, right? So uh, we try to let them know if they can get fund, funds to us immediately. Um, sometimes with wires, there are a holdup. So we let the buyer's lawyer know to, instead of wiring us the funds, to just deposit the funds into our account to ensure there's no hold um, on our bank accounts end, or if there's issues with the wire, that there's, there's no hold up on the transaction. So at the best that we can do are like we we would be able to handle that and let the buyer's lawyer know that we're selling to buy please make sure you d deposit the funds into our trust account 
um, we would be best to facilitate that at that point. And maybe if the buyer wants to just, I mean, the seller wants to just let the buyer know, hey, I'm selling to buy. So please make sure your mortgage is in order. Um, that's literally all we can do. Awesome. Thank you. That was very informative. So um, now there is a, a, a title search page, Nagamu, on the Ori Purchase and Sale Agreement. Um, technically, I, I think as a general rule of thumb, agents really put it a week or two before the actual completion date. Yeah. Um, maybe talk a little bit about you know, what that is and why is it important that we have sufficient time to be able to do our um, you know, due diligence on the title of the home. Um, so if you could talk a little bit about that, great. Yeah, so um, the standard title search um, dates are two weeks prior to closing. Um, I know some clients want it five days before they put it on the transact uh, on the APS that the title search date is to be five days prior to closing or a week prior to closing. The reason why we suggest two weeks as best practice is because Obviously, we want it close enough to the closing date that we can, if there's any encumbrances, we can requisition that and get the seller, bring it to the seller's uh, lawyer's attention to have it removed off of title, request for the, uh, the payouts if there's a postponement or if there's, uh, sorry, a notice of security interest on the property um, that requires to be paid out. The seller's lawyer has enough time to request that that payout, we want to give, basically, we want to give the seller's lawyer enough time to handle any title defects. So when you're doing a title search date with five days, when where the date is five days in advance of the closing, if there are tech, usually there aren't any title defects or serious title defects that, um, need to be rectified. But if there are where we need to make an application or something with the LRO, um, it, we need enough time or the seller's lawyer needs enough time to handle those matters. So um, five days or one week is not ideal. Two weeks is the best time to, or, or, or the, the best amount of time to handle any title defects or rectify any title defects. Okay, that makes sense. Thank you. So I'm going to pose this question to, to Jasmine. So, um, so I know with COVID-19, there's a lot of uncertainties that was brought up to, you know, to clients, their financial situation really changed. Um, they may not be able to kind of close on their transactions. So what are some of the things if um, our, our partners can really do if there is a firm real estate deal and you know the buyer or the seller cannot really close um so if you could maybe just go over some of the options and and you know um, and see how our partners and can really help facilitate to make sure that it, there's no you know liability or at least mitigate the liabilities as much as possible and find them a possibly a new new buyer as well so the first step would, of course, be to try to get a mutual agreement between the buyer and sellers, um, you know, with uh, negotiating any like, per diems or any sort of uh, extra fees and extending that date if possible, because you do not want to end up in litigation. It's really expensive and it's not worth anyone's time, right? Um, if an extension is not possible or the sides are not agreeable to an extension, then depending on the contract, you can potentially assign the agreement. So that's most, more so for new builds where the individual purchased the property a year or two ahead of time and their financial situation has changed and they may want to now sell their interest in the agreement to a third party. Um, and that's a good way to uh, potentially, you know, sell your interest in the contract and make a profit and walk away without having any uh, significant liabilities. Uh, with regards to the actual closing procedure, say that we're in the process of closing and um, due to um, some sort of mortgage circumstances or condition in the mortgage, uh, we're not able to get funding on final closing. I think, Shangs, you can speak more of this, but for the closing procedure, usually, uh, again, it just requires us to, you know, negotiate with the, the, the seller's lawyer, uh, potentially also get the realtors involved to try to come to a mutual understanding um, and, uh, you know, complete the contract within a week or two as required. Yeah, so um, usually it's best that the <clears throat> real estate agents um, handle any extension terms only because when lawyers get involved, lawyers can be like super adversarial and like, and, uh, you know, add extra fees and things like that that are unnecessary. When it's between the real estate agents, generally it's more of um, 
you know, it's handled better. Um, and there's less fees associated with that, um, with the um, extension requests or the extension terms. Um, but if it's not possible to be handled by the real estate agents, that's not a problem. We've negotiated several extension terms on behalf of our clients, whether we represent the seller or the buyer. Um, <clears throat> during COVID um, times, we, the, there's been, it's been common practice that, you know, lawyers work together to get the deal closed. So we try our best not to be adversarial, but you have sometimes some lawyers that, you know, just, you know, want to have be extra sometimes. So that's, uh, so it, it does get to that point at times, but it's, it's very, we just, you know, you request the extension, you let the clients know that, um, you know, when we represent the seller, we try our best to, you know, be um, understanding and let the client, the seller, advise the seller also to be understanding. So we try to work with the seller, our client as a seller and work with the buyer and, and get a mutually benefit, be beneficial extension terms. Um, and then, yeah, so we, you just, yeah, we just work with the other lawyer and get the, get the job done. Absolutely makes sense. I think, you know what it is, is it's, uh, it's, it's, uh, hmm. um, it's, we, we, I think we've seen a, quite a bit of other sides, the other lawyers trying to be also a little bit understanding during tough times like this that we, um, you know, everybody is, um, you know, trying to get their finances in order or if they made purchases, now their financial situations really changed. So I think we all essentially have to work as a team to, um, to make sure that, you know, the deal essentially gets closed, right? And, and we provide a, a good um, solution. So, um, yeah, Jazz, if you could provide a little bit of an update on what's been going on with Bill 184 and residential tenancies. So, um, if you could talk a little bit about that, that'd be great. Sorry, I was muted. Sure. So, um, with regards to the new bill, it is very broad, so I won't be able to cover everything in the bill. Um, on this webinar, but I will cover the important points. Um, so from a landlord perspective, uh, the first important point is that landlords can now bring uh, former tenants to the landlord tenancy board so that they can pursue um, any kind of unpaid bills, uh, utilities, uh, separate compensation for those from what is owed already, okay? And usually that has to be done within 12 months. Um, there's a bit more detail in the actual act itself. If you have any questions regarding that, you can email me. But um, yeah, so that's one of the first points. So landlords have some uh, compensation that they can be provided through the Landlord Tenancy Board. The other is uh, illegal rents. So uh, illegal rents will now become legal after 12 months. So if uh, a tenant has been agreeable and paying illegal rent for the last 12 months over the increase that's mentioned in the uh, Re Residential Tenancy Act, then uh, they cannot later on challenge that. And that's beneficial for any prospective purchasers or landlords because you don't have to worry about that challenge looming over your uh, purchase of a property or uh, um, potential later on if you're a landlord, that property being uh, challenged or the, sorry, the rent being challenged. And then the final point is regarding um, evictions. So there is a new process. The act's purpose is to streamline the uh, dispute process and how they've done that is by uh, encouraging uh, landlords and tenants to come to an agreement themselves through a repayment plan. And um, what that also does, is it allows landlords that if a tenant does agree to a repayment plan, they can potentially also include a clause that allows them to evict the tenant without a hearing um, through that plan if they do not make payments as required. And um, yeah, that's just the main points. There are a few other things like uh, utility bills and unpaid, I just actually, I believe it's just utility bills. Utility bills will need to be, um, the proceedings regarding that will need to be done through small claims courts. And then from the tenant side, there is uh, increased protection for them as well. Um, allowing landlords are required to provide more disclosure for no fault evictions through affidavits and documentation. Got it. Thank you. So, um, I wanted to ask a question with regards to a title transfer. So, so Shangami, so when there is a, um, when there's two, there, there are two people on the title of a home, one of them wants to be removed, um, or there's one single person, they want to add another, their father, their, their son, to the title of the home. 
Um, what could be some of the implications of, of completing a transaction like that? Um, and would it essentially take a little bit more than our normal process for the CA refinance transaction? Um, and would there be any other fees except um, you know, our you know, legal fees that uh, we normally charge? Yeah, so um, with title transfers, the additional step that would be different from a regular purchase and sale transaction would be independent legal advice. Um, so uh, I'll go through the step by step process, but if basically our, how our office operates um, and what is best practice is that if someone is being removed from title of the property, that, I, that the person being removed receives independent legal advice um, from a separate lawyer if we're representing both parties. So if we're representing the person who's on title um, and the person who's being added to title, it's best practice that the person being removed obtains independent legal advice to ensure that they are aware and that they understand the nature of the transaction, that they're losing an interest in the property, so on and so forth. Now, it depends on, that also depends on the nature of the relationship. So if it's father and son or mother and daughter, um, we generally do not require independent legal advice to be obtained by the mother who's being removed or the daughter who's being removed because it's an arm's length transaction and it's, it's, it's generally okay. Um, however, if it is a mother and daughter who's on title, the mother is being removed and now the daughter is adding her spouse to the property, at that point, we will require the mother to obtain independent legal advice just so that the mother is aware that you know it's their matrimonial home it's now the spouse um, has an interest in the property that the mother may not have been aware of um, and we need to ensure that the mother is fully aware of the, the nature of the transaction um, so she, the mother at that point would be required to get independent legal advice um, now, for land transfer tax purposes, there's only two reasons why land transfer tax would be payable in a title transfer transaction. One is um, if consideration is passing, um, or two, if there's a mortgage on the property and the mortgage is being assumed by the current person, uh, the person on title or the person being added to title. So I'll elaborate a little bit more on that. So the if, if consideration is passing, so I'm gonna, um, I own a property, I'm transferring title to my sister um, for consideration. I'm, I'm giving her, she's giving me $100,000 for the for my property. That at that point would require two separate lawyers because it would be a purchase and sale transaction. Um, land tax for tax would be applicable, but we wouldn't, it would not be a title transfer at that point. It's considered a purchase and sale and two lawyers would need to be, um, would need to be involved in the transaction. Now, um, if, if it's a situation where I'm on title with my mom and my mom is um, being removed um, I, and there's a mortgage on my property, if the mortgage, for example, is currently at $500,000 and my mom is on title for 1% of that of, on, on the property, I would have to pay land transfer tax on 1% of the remaining value of the mortgage. So it would be $5,000. Does that make sense? Yep. Okay. So um, if, however, if my mom owned the property as joint tenants with me, so 50-50 and she's being removed, I would have to pay 50% land transfer tax on that $500,000. So I would pay 200, land, tra land transfer tax on $250,000. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Yeah. So it depends on whomever is being removed and the, the percentage of their ownership that's being assumed. Land transfer tax is payable on that interest in the property that's being assumed by the new person being added or the person remaining on title. Uh, yeah. Okay. And Nick, you can always, if, if, if any of your clients have any questions on how much it applies, I mean, you know, feel free to kind of get in touch with, with me or the office. I will be more than happy to kind of give you the breakdown of the, the, the amounts as well. It could really honestly range. I've seen it from like $25 all the way to a couple of thousand dollars, right? So, yeah. um, okay. Just uh, before we got on to the next question, just want to let everybody know if, if, if there are any questions that you have that uh, maybe you want us to address. And there is a chat box in the, in the middle, uh, the bottom center. I'm actually just going to also type in a message in that chat box. Feel free to just leave us uh, your questions and we'll get to it before we end the call.
So, um, so I'll move on to our next question. So this, I just thought that we talk a little bit about assignment agreements. Um, I know that there's been a lot of new build purchases and a lot of clients are thinking of maybe, you know, exiting their agreement, uh, maybe investing in another property or getting into a property through an assignment agreement. So I thought if we use this opportunity to talk a little bit about how the assignment agreement really works and what you need to be mindful of when you talk to your clients. So, um, so Jazz, if you don't mind, maybe just talking a little bit about what conditions should be really inputted on the agreement to pr protect uh, clients. So the assignment agree agreement most widely used is usually the Aurea agreement. Um, that agreement is mainly built for resale assignments and sometimes does not have clauses that would protect a, it would not protect a client in a new build situation. Um, so I'm just going to discuss clauses that you can include to cover those um, potential you know things that are missing. The, so the first few things are conditions. You always want to include three important conditions in your assignment agreement. The first one being a consent clause. Most new build agreements uh, usually require the consent from the vendor and have certain conditions that must be satisfied before the uh, agreement, before the consent will be approved. So you always want to include a consent condition. Um, the second is a finance clause. Again, uh, the assignment agreement doesn't have a finance clause, so similar to a resale agreement, you want to include a finance clause in case the assignee needs uh, assistance with uh, a mortgage. The last condition clause you want to include is a clause requiring that the assignor, the seller, basically provides all documentation they have in their possession. So normally the seller will provide the APS and the disclosure, but if they also have a PDI in their possession or any kind of upgrade documents listing out the cost of those upgrades, you also want your client to have those so they're aware of the cost associated with that. Um, then another additional clause you want to include is who will pay the assignment fee. So normally this is paid by the, by the assignor, but you want to include a clause in the agreement addressing that. Uh, some builders do charge an assignment fee that can go up to almost $10,000, right? So you want to clarify who's going to pay that out of pocket and the legal fees for the builder as well. Additionally, you want to also cover occupancy fees. Uh, just clarifying again, although it may seem obvious, uh, you want to clarify that the occupancy payments will now be made by the assignee when they take over uh, possession of the property. Uh, HST, so HST is a little bit tricky with assignments. Uh, the rebate, usually the, uh, the, assign, the assignee is not eligible for the rebate and you wanna clarify that in the contract. Uh, we'll go into that a bit more detail when we get to the next question. Um, but also you wanna clarify the, who will pay the HST on the profit of the assignment. So the assignment consideration that the assigner is receiving may potentially be taxable. And you want to clarify who is going to be responsible for that tax at a later date in the agreement as well. Okay. Um, continuing on closing costs. Again, the agreement doesn't necessarily, the ORI agreement does not necessarily address these. So you want to clarify who will be responsible for the closing costs on final closing. Um, the structure of payments as well is very important. If you've ever read the schedule B in an assignment agreement, it's not very clear. So you want to clarify how that will be broken down. And that depends on, the client's uh, specific situation. If you're representing the assignor, you want to make sure that uh, you get as much payment up front as possible because, again, you're releasing the interest to the agreement and deposits. If you're the assignee, you want the opposite. You want to pay as much as possible closest to final closing uh, because, again, you may need mortgage financing to cover that amount. Um, you also want to clarify when those amounts will be released. So there are situations when uh, brokerages or lawyers are holding funds, but the, there won't be any clause about releasing that. And then that can cause problems because one party may assume that that should be released uh, right away. And the other might assume that it has to be held until final closing. So you want to address that as well. Uh, another clause that's important to put into the agreement is what happens if the builder cannot complete the project, right? Does the assignee get his deposits back? We, you want to put a clause in there that addresses that as well. Um, and then of course, an indemnity clause, most consent agreements from builders will still require the assignor to be liable to complete the agreement if the assignee cannot complete the agreement. So you want to include an indemnity possibly to, uh, you know, prevent the, uh, to allow the assigner the ability to go after the assignee if they're not able to close the assignment agreement. And then the final one is a non-residency non -residency stat deck. Um, most agreements require that the person is resident in Canada, I believe. 
So you want to include that clause in there as well. Uh, all these clauses that I've listed, uh, if you ever need any assistance with the drafting of those clauses, you can contact our law firm, of course, and we will happily help you with that. Um, now, on the same topic, so would the assignee be eligible to receive an HSD rebate if they plan to occupy the unit as their principal residence? So it depends on the builder. Some do allow it, most do not. So um, whenever I'm advising a client, I usually tell them that they won't be eligible for the HST rebate and that they will have to bring that amount in. You can try to negotiate that point, but from my experience, they usually uh, do not provide it. And the reasoning behind that is they've never dealt with the third party and they don't want to take on the risk of having to give that person a rebate. And then, you know, if, if something goes wrong, they have to chase after a third party in the contract. Got it. Now, what's our um, legal process, Jazz, when you represent clients in an assignment closing? So, yeah, so an assignment is pretty complex. There's about three contracts usually involved in it. Um, so it has usually about three stages. So the first one, of course, is reviewing the agreement, you know, ensuring that the clauses that I've discussed are there and, and, and the client is protected. The next stage is if you're the assignor and we're representing the assignor, we would request consent from the builder. So we would want to uh, satisfy that consent condition and have the uh, builder provide us with the consent document, which we would review with the client and then prepare the documents that would list out the warranties in the assignment agreement and deal with any transfer of funds. Um, after that portion is done, that would be considered the assignment closing. So that's one portion done. That's when, you know, the assignment is binding now in all parties. After the assignment is completed, there's still the final closing. So if we are representing the assignee, final closing will be like a normal final closing that includes occupancy. You know, if there's possession involved, signing builder documents and uh, things like that. And then of course the uh, closing where the funds are transferred and titles transferred into the assignee's name. If we're representing the assignor, sometimes the agreements include clauses that say that the funds won't be paid until final closing. And at that time, we would have to prepare additional documents, ensure the funds are transferred and that the final conditions in the agreement are completed. Okay, got it. And obviously um, we always recommend putting solicitor review as a condition. So giving us time to kind of go through that and, uh, and represent, you know, and advise each side what they should be really be doing. Yeah, right? that's a good point. That was actually a big omission from my side. <laughs> yeah, always include a solicitor review condition in your agreement. Of course, <laughs> I got you. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So, um, so if the assignor has any cap levies with the builder, can it be transferred to the assignee? Yeah, so they can be transferred. However, you need to look at the amendment directly. I have seen sometimes the amendments will say that this right only applies to the original purchaser. And so again, that's when the solicitor review clause comes in handy. Uh, you always want to have a lawyer review that to ensure that you are entitled to those same caps, or if you are not, you're accounting for those uh, when taking into consideration the price. Okay, got it. Thanks. So we had a question from actually one of our, one of our, um, uh, one of our partners. So I thought maybe you can address that. I think you mentioned about a little bit um, earlier, but this is to do with the HSD rebate for new construction. So this is an example. So Adam buys a unit for a hundred thousand from a builder and assigns it to John before closing for a profit of 150,000. So will you be, will you be calculating the HSD rebate to be paid on closing for a principal as John was moving into the property based on the original purchase price of 100,000? And if so John gets the rebate back, since he's living in that unit, would the rebate be calculated for 100,000 and just you know whatever the percentage is for the rebate? Yeah, so normally the rebate is uh, calculated on the original purchase price. And um, normally that's prepared by the builder from the statement of adjustments and things like that. So those numbers are usually already put into the documents. Okay, got it. So I wanted to pose our last questions to, to Shangami. So if you could talk a little bit about, so when there is separation, so when a couple is being separated and they're planning to sell their home um, or refinance to buy out the other party as a result, um, what is really requires from clients to ensure that uh, there's a smooth closing um, and is it any different in a common law relationship? Okay. Um, so for real estate purposes, 
legally married spouses and common law spouses are considered the same. So they're just spouses of one another. Um, so, but, but that's for real estate purposes only. So common law legally married spouses are considered spouses and are just spouses. Um, when, in regards to separating spouses and transfer title transfers or refinances, um, title transfers and refinances, ILA is very, very important and it cannot be waived. So, um, for example, if there is a separation agreement um, and there's no ILA on it, in order for our firm to represent both parties in the transaction, there needs to be ILA obtained on the separation agreement. If the clients don't want to proceed with, you know, they've already signed the agreement, they, they're fine with it, they don't want to rehash it, they don't want to get independent legal advice on it, then we would not be able to represent both parties in that transaction. We would represent one and another law firm would represent another. So it's really important to bring that to the client's attention in advance um, and in order to bring it like so that they're aware that if there is ILA has not been obtained or yeah, ILA hasn't been obtained on the separation agreement that two lawyers will have to be involved. Now, if there is a client and they're separating and they don't have a separation agreement, it's very, very important that they do obtain one. The reason being is because um, the, in order for a land transfer tax to be exempt, so let me backtrack a little bit. So if there's a, if there's a mortgage on the property, and the mortgage is um, being assumed by the person remaining on title and they're buying out, you know, the person being removed, um, land transfer tax would be applicable in that case because there's consideration. But when there is a separation agreement in place, we can, a, a land transfer tax would be exempt because we would select that statement under the exemption section of the title transfer. We would select that on TerraView um, and that would exempt any party from paying land transfer tax. So in order to be exempt, there needs to be a separation agreement um, in place. Um, uh, so yeah, that's basically the general gist of it. Um, ILA is super important. Um, if ILA is not uh, present or is, has not been obtained on separation agreement, two lawyers would have to be involved in the transaction. So it's very important to bring that to the client's attention in advance. Got it. Thank you for that. Um, so I'm just going to pass it on to, to Lena to go over some of the uh, questions that you, um, you, you, uh, you input it on the box. So she'll go over the questions and, uh, and assign it to a person to be able to answer it for you. Okay. Pass it on to you, Lena. <laughs> okay. Thanks, Cheyenne. Um, we've got some good questions here. Guys, don't be shy. If you have any more, we have a few minutes, so feel free to throw them in there and we'll see what we can get to. Um, let's see what we want to cover first. Um, we have a <clears throat> good question here about an assignment. Um, Jazz, maybe I will throw this one your way. Um, I'll read over the question, though, for those of you who aren't seeing it. In an assignment case, considering that the builder most likely won't provide the HST rebate, does that mean the assignor need not worry about HST payment on the sale? Uh, Jazz, you want to take a crack at that? Sure. So that would depend on whether the uh, assignor is considered a builder or an individual. If they're considered a builder, meaning that they bought the property for the purpose of flipping it, then mm -hmm. they will potentially have to pay HST on the profit that they made. If they're considered an individual and they can prove that it was their primary place of residence to live, for example, they work in Toronto, they bought a condo in Toronto, or, you know, it's a one bedroom, then they won't have to pay that amount. Um, there's a bunch of factors listed on the CRA website that outline when someone's considered a builder and when they're not. Uh, an example they gave is if someone's buying a one bedroom in Toronto, but they have a family, right? They're not going to expect four people to live in a one bedroom condo. So you wouldn't be able to prove that, you know, that was going to be your primary place of residence. So to answer your question, uh, it depends on how the assigner is treated, whether as an individual or as a builder. Perfect. Okay, thanks, Jazz. That's great. You're welcome. Um, we have we have another question here, which kind of uh, uh, is uh, has some family law components to it. And what some of you might not know is that Shang's here has actually has a lot of experience in family law in addition to real estate. So you're really you're getting the best of both worlds today. Um, so the question is, <clears throat> I was informed in common law marriages, the common law spouse has no entitlement uh, to the matrimonial home. Is this correct? This is, 
I know you know all about this stuff, so let's hear it. Yes, this is actually correct. Um, so for real estate purposes, common law and, and legally married spouses are one in the same. Um, however, in regards to family law and matrimonial rights to a, a property, um, it's, it, go, it does not fall under the real estate portion. It falls under, under family law. So in order to have any sort of entitlement to a matrimonial home, you must be legally married. Um, common law are, is not awarded, to, uh, awarded those same rights as a legally married uh, couple. So that's very important to know. So if the, if a common law, if, you know, there's a common law couple and one party is not on title, but is paying the mortgage, is paying all of these things, they are not automatically entitled to 50% interest in the property. That is not the case. They would have to make a claim um, as a dependent at that point. Um, so that's very important to know that common law is not awarded the same rights as a legally married couple. Thanks, Shane. That's great. So let me just push you a little further on that one. So let's say I have a common law partner. I have been in this relationship for 25 years. We've lived in the home together. We decide to split up. You're telling me that I have no rights to the matrimonial home whatsoever. Yeah. So unless you, this is why it's very important that you seek um, legal advice from a family law lawyer, um, because that is what is important when having a cohab agreement. Um, in, and that's why it's important to have a cohab agreement in place, right? So you, so the cohab agreement will stipulate, you know, in the event, knock on wood, of a separation, these are the terms and conditions of the matrimonial home or, or the home that we both, that we reside in as our primary residence. Um, so if there are any individuals that are cohabitating together and one individual is not on title, they've been making payments, um, regular payments to the property, the upkeep, you know, mortgage payments, things like that. It's very, very important that a cohab agreement is put in place to stipulate all of these conditions and terms, um, knock on wood, in the event of a separation. Thanks. So just for those of you who, don't, who aren't familiar, a cohab agreement is a cohabitation agreement. And that's an agreement that you would enter into with a common law partner that would, um, it would talk about what's to happen if you're to split up, similar to, you know, a prenuptial agreement or a marriage contract, which is what we call it on Ontario, would be used to contract certain things for a married couple. Um, and I mean, Shanks, it's a really interesting case because why would they, I mean, I'm asking you a question that I have no business asking you because you're not, you know, you're not the attorney general's office. Why the difference? Why are they treating common law Couples different than marriage, married couples. In this it's group. honestly because of the law, the previous law. Um, you know, we're just old fashioned and we yeah, have exactly, to modern exactly, times. I guess. That's yeah, what I exactly. thought. <laughs> 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 now that's that's what I figure. But this is something that there are a lot of <clears throat> there are a lot of uncertainties about. So although this is the law, it does not mean that you can't contract out of it. So I think Shane's correct me if I'm wrong. What you're trying to say is, absent an agreement like this. The law is that the common law spouse does not have an interest in this matrimonial home um, the way that they would if you're legally married. However, if you would like to make sure that the law applies the way that you see fit or the way that you're agreeing as a couple, you can come to a lawyer. I mean, our firm does this, for example, and have a cohabitation agreement drafted that would say, look, upon a uh, breakdown of this relationship, you know, A, B, C, we would like it to happen like and then that agreement would then be, you know, be used to decide what happens if the relationship would be break up, broken up. Does that make sense? Yeah, exactly. And absent an agreement, um, there are other avenues like a dependent claim, dependency claim and things like that, which uh, you should, the client should seek, you know, family law advice on. Um, dependency claims are, you know, very difficult to make and they're very difficult to be, to receive. Um, I, Generally, I don't like if yeah if you if anyone has any questions about that they can reach out to me. Um, however, it is best um, that uh, a family law lawyer is uh, legal advice is sought out in regards to that. Yeah, we actually it's interesting because we always get a lot of family law questions just because there's a lot of obscurity around it and a lot of the laws just honestly to be frank haven't really caught up with just modern times. So um, we're here. If you ever do have questions on it, we can. Um, direct you to someone at our firm or another firm or whatever to, to give you answers on that. But there's a lot of just a lot of misconceptions. So happy to answer those questions. Um, 
But let's jump in. We've got a couple minutes left. Let's see what we can do to answer some of these remaining questions. Um, is land transfer tax applicable if you are refinancing to buy out a business partner uh, in the case of a new mortgage? Um, Shangs or Jazz, do either of you guys want to um, either ask for clarity or try to answer that? Yeah, I, I do believe uh, um, I do believe land transfer tax is applicable because a, ref, a, a new mortgage is um, being paid out. Um, but Brett, if you want to reach out to me directly, I will be more than happy. If you want to give me more contacts, I'll be more than happy to um, discuss that further with you. But generally, the answer would be yes. Okay, awesome. Um, okay, I'm going to switch things up a little bit here because you've heard enough from our lawyers today and we're going to put Alon on the spot for one of these questions because we just had a conversation about this earlier today and he's had lots of tenants and has some great thoughts on this. So question being, <clears throat> could I get more details on utilities with regard to landlord and tenant and what is the best way to set up split utilities with new tenants to protect the landlord? So Alon, we're happy to jump into some more legal sort of uh, answers, but I know you can probably knock this one off quite easily. Do you wanna take a crack at answering it? Sure, so I'll take the practical uh, approach as opposed to the legal approach. The first thing I would add is that it's definitely in the best interest as anyone who's a landlord to basically have your tenants somehow involved in the utilities. Uh, anyone will tell you that in the event that there isn't skin in the game by your tenants, the abuse of the utilities will could make or break you as uh, profitable on that apartment or unit at all. If we're talking in regards to a new tenant, my best advice on the utility side would be uh, to install a submeter. It's become so cheap now that I believe between a submeter and the installation, uh, it would be under $1,000. At that point in time, the, the tenant would be responsible for the electricity to their own unit. If they don't pay, they basically get shut off. So that uh, probably would be my best advice in regards to the electricity. Uh, the other option, the typical option is normally a percentage of the utilities with regards to the gas and the electricity. Um, normally what happens is it's a percentage of what the utility bill is. You can present that basically to your tenant and they would have to pay a percentage. The only issue um, becomes in this scenario is you become, you have to kind of chase that money from your tenant. So you, if you have a tenant who's not responsible, you've got to kind of turn into a collection agency in order to collect that money. Uh, the other is an upfront separate. What, so I should say what I find the simplest is basically You've got a rent fee and a utility fee for your tenant. And at that point in time, it's an X percentage of the fixed cost every month. Um, so it could be 100 or $150 above the rent and that gets collected every month. Uh, but once again, going back, just to reiterate, if, you're, if it's a new tenant and you're able to install a submeter, my advice would be to get that submeter installed. Silly question for you along before uh, we run out of time here. Installing a submeter, can you break it down for, for those of us who have never done it before? How do you get it? How much, you told, I think, told us how much it costs, about 600 bucks. How do you get it and who do you call to get it? Well, very simple. So you want to get an install, a submeter installed. Any licensed electrician um, basically would be able to install within three to four hours. He can purchase a submeter. And then basically it's just a matter of calling the electrical company in order to connect it. Uh, and then at that time, you're off to the races. It's basically a separate apartment, whether it's a fourplex, sixplex, or even just a basement apart, a legal basement apartment in a house. Um, anyone who's really interested, I have an amazing nutrition, happy to you know, give this information out. Um, but very, very, very nice. Simple. Yes. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Alon. That's actually super helpful. Um, and um, if, if there are any other questions on that topic, just in terms of the legal side of it, I think Alon, you actually answered that perfectly. We're here, feel free to send follow-up questions. Uh, we have two minutes left and I'm gonna see how quickly Jazz can answer this question. Uh, see if you can do it in 120 seconds. Um, representing an assigner, how do you safely structure an assignment deal with giving consent and transfer the name change yet the assignee will be liable to pay the rest of cash required on the closing date uh, using the mortgage funds. 
Um, so Jazz, I don't know if you need that <clears throat> clarified at all, but would so you? So I think I know what, um, what the individual is discussing. I think it's when an assignment deal is structured in a way that the majority of the funds that the assignor is receiving, they're gonna receive on final closing. Um, so the best way to structure that is to require two conditions in the agreement. One, that the payment will be made on final closing or prior to final closing. And then also an undertaking from the assignee and the assignee's lawyer that they will not close the transaction until those funds have been transferred over. That protects you from um, any kind of issues with regards to payment. That, that's awesome. And that was very quick. I'm impressed. Uh, so uh, um, if any of you need help with that, if you need specific wording, because I know people do reach out from time to time asking for specific wording to be able to put those uh, conditions in place. Again, that's what we're here for. Don't be shy to reach out. We're happy to help. Um, okay, I think we are good. I think we have one minute left and we've wrapped everything up. Um, Cheyenne, do you want to sort of uh, say good? Yeah, so I want to remarks? thank uh, everybody for tuning in. I know it's, uh, it's been a busy time. It's been a really busy summer. Um, wish you guys all um, a, a great um, fall season ahead. Um, and you know, reach out to us. We're we're very looking forward to working with you to making sure um, you know your closings will go really smooth. So I want to thank uh, you know Jazz, Dangami, you know everybody, uh, Lon and Brian for um, you know um, for helping me host this. And we look forward to tuning in next time with you guys. Okay, have yourself a great day. Bye everyone. Bye, Bye everybody. Bye.